have at least one job or project done that you look at a few years later and say that there is nothing to improve or refactor? And yeah, hello world does not count. Mm. <laughs> so I've got some thoughts on that. What do you What do you think, Jason? You go first on this one. I'm trying to I'm trying to go through some in my head. Fair enough. So <clears throat> my initial thought was obviously every project could could be improved. Um, and every project could use some refactoring. But from a pragmatic standpoint, even though every project could be written better or more succinctly or use better design patterns or whatever it might be, I think that there are some projects that don't really need to be refactored from a pragmatic standpoint just because they serve the purpose. Um, and like the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Meaning if the project is never going to be iterated on, meaning no features are ever going to be added, uh, no customer or user is ever going to want to um, add functionality, then realistically, if you're providing value with that piece of software or that game or project, then I'd argue that there's no need to refactor it or change it. So yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, I, I say there's usually there's two kinds of projects, right? So it's the kind of work I do. Is either projects I do for myself or those projects I do as a contractor or um, on someone else's team. In the case where I'm on someone else's team, uh, I find just from a psychological perspective, it's easier to divorce yourself from the uh, objectives of the entire project and ownership of it and just sort of like focus on your area. It isn't to say you don't have feedback and you don't engage with wanting it to succeed, but it's sort of keeping your focus on um, the use cases you're responsible for is usually what I do. And so if you take it to that extreme and say, are there systems or components of another project that you've done you're happy with and you just sort of nothing else to change on? There's a few. Mostly I did things like keyboard virtualizers, uh, sort of like in, in Unity, there's like a virtual keyboard that would type as you type and types on a screen and stuff and it has nice animations. That's cool. Nice systems for that with like, you know, uh, command queues and all sorts <clears> of the nice features. I've got other stuff too in the past for event systems and pooling systems and all stuff that I've used uh, numerous projects that I'm quite happy with. Um, as for like a whole cohesive project, to be honest, not really, but only because it's either someone else's project and there's always something you'd like to add or it's your project. And let's be real, if you're the product owner, there's, there's infinite amount of features you're going to want to add. You're never going to say it's done. If it's a question of whether it's done um, feature-wise or done in terms of refactoring, I don't know. There are there are points where you look at code and say, any more refactoring I'll be doing will be just sort of uh, self congratulations, <laughs> adding extra features and sort of, you know, in, in I don't know, messing with this. It's my favorite really, type of refactoring. Yeah, yeah. Where you say, I know it works, but let's add, you know, twelve more classes just arbitrarily because it's fun. Yeah, no, that's that's a, a bad idea. And and usually, if if you get to the point where you start questioning, can I refactor this perfectly working and clean code further? The answer is don't even if you can realistically until new features come along. So not really, not not. I don't think, I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I've kind of stopped and went, you know, uh, this is perfect, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's good enough. And I think that's quite frankly the better goal. You know, what was it? Yeah. Uh, perfect's the enemy of done. I think they say. Oh wow! So yeah, that's good. Stick stick with what you need to do, and that's good enough. You know? <laughs> Yeah, and like what was mentioned in chat here, Yagni, you ain't going to need it, is what that stands for. Um, and don't forget KISS. Keep it simple, keep stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you really should just approach code in general in that way. Um, and that is you you write what you need. And, you know, that is that should be included when you're looking back at a project and trying to determine or, or a piece of code or a feature. Do I need to refactor this? Uh do I need to rewrite it? And the question really should be first, do I need to refactor this? And sure, you should always approach writing code, um, you know, with the solid principles and clean coding and all those things that make it flexible and open to change in the future. Um, but really, I think for the most part, refactoring should be driven by a need to refactor. And that's... Yeah, I've kind of yeah. figured out there's, there's like three ways you can talk about your code. You can say... Uh, is it clean? You can say, does it do what I need it to do? And three, uh, is it extensible? And I find that asking, is it clean, is kind of a nebulous and pointless question because there's always standards that are different from yours. There's always extra stuff you can do. So I try to avoid asking myself, is my code clean enough or is it refactored enough? I prefer to say, 
does it one do what I actually <laughs> was paid to do or the task <laughs> is required? And if it does, does it do so in a way that I can assume the next extensible feature is to be added and I can add those without having to rewrite what's here? And if I can do both of those things, even if it's technically a mess, it hits every goal I actually have. It's just in order to get to that second goal of being able to be extensible, probably will be clean. It's very hard to write code that's not clean and easily extensible. So I would <laughs> yeah. make those two the goal, not the clean code per se, you know? I see it sounds like the classic Venn diagram where you've got like the three circles and you know you can only pick one or you can only pick two yeah. out of the three. Two and out of the three, yeah. There's there's some sort of like point that as it moves around, you get some some percentage of each one. But yeah, it sounds about right. So I guess the answer to the question is yes and no. It all depends. Yeah, I'm, like I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad we can give you a very distinct <laughs> Answer, it's like most programming questions I get are like the answer is like, well, it kind of depends. What do you what are you trying to do here? So I guess the first question I would ask myself uh, in that situation is, do I need to do I need to refactor? Otherwise, nah, I wouldn't refactor it. I mean, I probably would because I'm an anal and a perfectionist, but I wouldn't recommend do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> you could also take like a smaller side and ask sort of like the hidden underlying question to that, which is. Mm. Have you ever written code you're proud of when you open it again a second time? That's a, that's a kind of a slightly different question. And oftentimes you'll open older code and you'll be kind of horrified because just the nature of having a career that involves learning, yeah. means a week goes by and you've learned something new. And by the time you open old code, you're like, I could have done that better. I could have done it more efficiently. There's always something you can do to change it. But I will admit there are some times where I've been given a project that I've done. And again, because I do contracting mostly, I've handed it off to a client and I've walked away. And then six months later or a year later, they'll come back and say, we like the last thing. Can you add these two new features? And I'll open it and go, oh, God, I haven't seen this thing in a year. What does it look like? <laughs> and it's like, I look at it and I go, OK, I can see what it's doing. I, I don't remember writing it, but I can read it. Yeah. And it's, then I have to add a new feature. And I add the feature and it takes me a day. And I'm like, OK, OK, it was good. I, well, yeah. I, I, I put the right hooks in place. It was easy for me to inject <laughs> new behaviors. And then you're a bit proud of yourself. Then you're like, I did it. I literally I built the system with the expectation for features to come down the pipeline, and I guessed to the right boundary lines. Yeah. And that's the closest I've ever gotten to. It may not be perfect, but it's exactly what I wanted it to be, and I kind of proved it later on. So you do sometimes get that. Yeah. I had a, a similar experience where I had written uh, an integration not related to game development, sorry. It was just some boring business uh, integration that I wrote. And I wrote it, a couple months went by, and I actually had to fly to the company whose application I was integrating with. Um, and I had to test it in front of their QA guy. And this guy ran it through the ringer. It was it was crazy. Um, Classic QA people, they just destroy your code every time. Dude, yeah. It was wild. He, he wouldn't tell me what he was doing too. He'd just be like, I'm gonna test this now. And then he'd be like, can you set up your application to do this? And I was like, okay. And then he would like slam it. But over the course of that QA um, experience, I actually, there were things that I had to change. And I was, I had flown into their headquarters and I was there for about, uh, I think it was four days. And it was one of those things where they were like, listen, if we get done early, you can fly back early. And I was like, heck yeah, I want to go because it, it was in the middle of nowhere. But mm -hmm. during the course, over the course of this, uh, of this QA process, the, he found things that truly were broken and that I had to fix. Um, and I was pleased because while I hadn't looked at the code in, the, in a while, I was a, I, I mean, this is kind of like a humble brag, I guess. I was able to very easily fix all the things that he found and i was like wow you know that right there honestly is my anecdote of the power of clean coding following practices even though it took a took longer to sort of reason about the code when i first wrote it and it really did pay off in a huge way so yeah it was, it was great it's my and anecdote to play devil's advocate on that i have done the opposite too hmm. so there was one system I wrote once, which was a sort of a single sign-on system. The idea was multiple people were um, using a gateway portal that I'd <clears> written <throat> to take their current Active Directory login details and mm. log them into various websites. So connected APIs and sort of uh, bypassed a lot of the login details. It was an internal system, and it was one of those companies where you actually had a key fob at your computer to scan oh, to wow. let yourself into the computer. So they really cared about their security. So the system I wrote was can I log you in automatically without having to distribute passwords for every single sub account? And so that was fine. System worked great. Uh, and I had a built-in logger that would log various different, you know, at this time, this person logged in 
or this person failed, they didn't have access to the system, and so on. And I wrote it as a text file, and it would build up, and I made sure, because I've been through this before, you don't want the text file to get too big, otherwise it'll cause issues and, and crash servers. So you, you let it get to a certain size, you, you, you make new files based on uh, dates and uh, per day, and then you sort of fill it up with all the different login information. And it was all great, all worked fine. And the way I did it is I used a kind of arbitrarily custom log notation, right? I wrote <laughs> it in as um, person's name, tab, dash, you know, whether or not they had access, time of date in a sort of a, a UTC format or whatever, and it all worked fine. But then, as I said, I get a request down the pipeline maybe uh, four months later, and they go, oh, uh, we want to be able to search through the history of people who've logged in. I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't take that into account as a feature that might happen. So I had to now write code that would parse my printed strings in my text files because I didn't put them in a sensible format like CSV, like a sane person should have done. <laughs> so I had to write this horribly hacky code that would read back the strings and like literally count spaces and then chop on oh my uh, gosh. characters and use indexes. And then because I knew certain messages were longer than others, I had to like search for words to estimate the length of the message and then cut it. It was horrible and it was a nightmare. Yeah. But when I was done, I, I took the whole lot. It would, it would cut to um, CSV, and I would then read the CSV back in and generate a HTML grid that would let me parse and search it. So it was really cool and looked very simple at the outset. And the, the, the boss, she was very happy because like, it, it was what she asked for. But it took me three weeks, two and a half weeks, to, to write the parser, do the thing, write the associated website, write the new CSV parser. And it was like, if I'd just written it right, if I'd, if I'd done it the right way the first time, it would have honestly taken me three days. Yeah. Now, obviously, I didn't tell her that, <laughs> but that's one of those little life lessons where it's sort of, if you keep an eye on what will probably happen down the line, you write the code with that eye for change. And it's like, that's the real point of clean code, you know? Save yourself lots of extra work in the future. Yeah. Listen.